Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted you stayed until the end. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is I am going to talk about ways to talk about artificial intelligence. I am going to talk about how journalists really use AI. And I'm going to talk about what we have to be careful about when we're building AI or other technology for journalism. So what I do in my work is I build uh, AI tools for investigative reporting. So one of the things I invented is something I call a story discovery engine. It's a tool that helps investigative reporters to quickly and efficiently uncover new story ideas in public affairs data. And a couple of years ago, when I started, uh, started talking about this, uh, people would, would react by saying, what? And they kind of didn't understand what I was talking about when I said that uh, I built artificial intelligence tools. And they would say things like, okay, well, story discovery engine, do you mean it's like a machine that like spits out a story idea? And I would say, well, no, but that sounds really cool. Uh, it's, uh, it's slightly different though. And so I realized that there are a lot of misconceptions out there about artificial intelligence. And so it's really important to be specific about our terms when we're talking about AI in journalism. So I wanna start by saying what AI is not. Okay, so AI is not this, all right? It's not, uh, it's not the Terminator, it's not the Skynet, it's not Commander Data from Star Trek, uh, it's not any of the Hollywood stuff, all right? What AI is really is AI is a branch of computer science, the same way that algebra is a branch of mathematics. And inside the field of artificial intelligence, there are lots of interesting subfields. There's machine learning, there's expert systems, there's natural language processing. And these are all really interesting, but machine learning is the juggernaut. And so this really interesting linguistic thing has happened, where when people say AI, and they say, oh, I'm using AI in my business, usually what they mean is I'm using machine learning. But the two terms have become confused. So I think it's really important to be specific in our terminology when we're talking about using AI for business or using AI in journalism so that we don't confuse our audiences and so that we don't get out over our own skis. So another way to think about this is to think about the distinction between Hollywood images of AI and what is real about AI. So the Hollywood stuff, uh, is a class that we call general artificial intelligence. So general AI encompasses the singularity, it's the Terminator, it's the robots who are gonna take over the world, uh, it's the paperclip machine that's going to like make so many paperclips that it's going to drown out humanity, which is all really exciting to think about, uh, but it's totally imaginary. So what's real is narrow AI. And narrow AI is what machine learning is. But again, it sounds really confusing because it sounds like there's something sentient in the computer, and there really isn't. Artificial intelligence as a term sounds like there's something sentient in the computer. Sounds like on some level there could be a little brain somewhere in the computer, and it's simply not true. But it is confused with our Hollywood notions. Okay, so narrow AI is real, general AI is imaginary, and narrow AI ultimately is just math. It's beautiful, gorgeous, magnificent math, but it's just math. So this is really important to keep in mind. And so this distinction becomes really important when we think about AI in journalism, because people imagine that what we're doing when we do AI in journalism is Super fancy. They think that we've got cats with lasers coming out of their eyes and that we're going to be able to use AI as this magical tool that's going to you know, allow us insights on an unprecedented scale. And they also think things like, oh, it's going to someday be possible to build an artificial intelligence that's going to replace human beings. And we're going to get rid of all the reporters and the machines are going to write everything. And again, it's super fun to think about, but that's not reality. Okay. What we actually do when reporters use AI in journalism is we think about what is the right tool for the task. Okay, so sometimes 
we don't need a very sophisticated tool. Sometimes we just need a plain old knife. And sometimes we need a tool that is way more high powered. All right, so it depends on what we're trying to do. Uh, are we trying to generate a lot of stories about exactly the same thing? Okay, well then, yes, absolutely, we should use automated methods to say, generate a lot of stories about earnings reports, because those stories are roughly the same every single time, and automated methods work really well for that. All right, but if we're doing high level investigative work that has never been done before, then we're probably going to take a more artisanal approach. All right, so I think about artisanal approaches versus factory production when I think about AI in journalism, and I think about what is the right tool for the task. And as far as who is actually using AI in journalism, uh, a few years ago, I started, when I started talking about AI for journalism, I, I would say there are actually very few people using AI in journalism. And then I sat down and started making a list, and I realized that over the past five years, there's really been an explosion. And there are a bunch of news organizations who are really effectively using AI in their business, which is fantastic. I was thrilled to, uh, I was thrilled to realize this. Uh, so there are a couple of, uh, a couple of major themes here. Uh, we've got automated writing happening at AP and Bloomberg and the Washington Post and Reuters. Uh, and in fact, the Bloomberg automated writing team, uh, props to you guys, you're one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite automated writing teams. I think what you're doing in the terminal is really terrific. Uh, and again, automated writing, it is really great when you are writing basically the same story over and over and over again, which is a lot of what we do in journalism, right? And it's great. Let's absolutely use the computer to help us out on that task. Uh, then we've got uh, uses of AI in investigations. So ProPublica and the Atlantic Journal Constitution uh, have both used machine learning in order to uh, process lots of documents and find leads for investigative stories uh, in these document dumps. Uh, my own work uh, in the story discovery engine uh, is about taking public affairs data in a particular domain, so say campaign finance or public education, and using expert system analysis, uh, or using a hybrid expert system, uh, to uncover leads. Over at the New York Times, they're doing a lot of, uh, they're doing AI on the uh, investigative side, and then they're also using it on the business side of the operation to do data analysis about their readers, to find out what their readers are reading and also figure out how to deliver the readers the content that they want better. Uh, ICIJ is using it to uncover leads. They have a really terrific investigation about medical devices. So they had a hunch that the, the suffer that people were suffering from uh, consequences of medical devices, but they had a hunch that the consequences were underreported. So what they did was they took a whole bunch of documents describing how people had died and used machine learning to analyze these documents in order to find cases where it was likely that a person had suffered a complication from a med medical device. And then they followed that up with additional reporting. Okay, and the additional reporting step is really important to emphasize, right? What AI got them in that case was it got them leads, but it did not replace the reporter. There was still a human in the loop. Uh, Quartz is doing some interesting work with their bot studio. I see the Quartz bot studio here. Fantastic work. Uh, and then uh, the Coral Project, uh, which is now at Vox Media, is using AI uh, to try and address the problem of toxic comments. So they're using machine learning to uh, try and identify what are toxic comments and encourage uh, better comments. 
Okay, so lots of really fantastic manifestations of artificial intelligence. I should say, what these all have in common though is they're very expensive, all right? They're very expensive, they're very time consuming, and they require very, very specialized labor that is not necessarily the same kind of labor that reporters and editors are trained to do. Okay, so it requires some retraining, it requires hybrid teams. Often you'll have to use more people than you expect in order to do a computational project because you need a writer, uh, you need a reporter, you need an editor, you need a data analyst, you need a tech project manager, you need uh, a sysadmin, who, you need a security person. Uh, we, we have this notion that computational projects are faster, cheaper, and better than old-fashioned projects, but actually data journalism, computational journalism, it's more expensive than old-fashioned reporting. All right? So we just need to be honest with ourselves about that so there aren't any surprises. So the big idea that I want to leave you with is that the robots are not coming for journalism jobs. The robots are our friends, and they can help us, uh, but they are not going to replace us. And one of the things that we really need to be careful about when we're talking about AI in journalism is a concept that I call techno-chauvinism. So techno-chauvinism is the idea that technology is superior to people, right? And this is a kind of underlying bias that's out there in the world. Uh, it's the underlying bias in our notions about disruption, right? So this, this fantasy that somehow reporters are going to be replaced by computers is an example of techno-chauvinism. And so when I was writing my book, I, I really engaged deeply with this idea of techno-chauvinism because I wondered where did it come from? How did we start thinking that doing something by computer was more valuable or more important than a human doing something? Because really it's not a competition, right? Like it's about using the right tool for the task. And I realized that our ideas about technology and society all come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. All right. So here we have some of the really talented, amazing folks who have given us today's technological world. Uh, here we have Claude Shannon, who's the father of information theory. Uh, we have Alan Turing, who we all knew who Alan Turing is. Uh, we've got Marvin Minsky, widely considered the father of artificial intelligence. We've got John von Neumann, who invented the underlying hardware architecture of every computer you've ever used. And then we've got Larry Page and Sergey Brin, founders of Google. And so what do these folks all have in common? <laughs> you can say it, come on. They're white and they're men. What about their educational backgrounds? Anybody know anything about their educational background? Where did they go to school? Elite colleges, all right, so they're mostly kind of Ivy League, Oxbridge. Uh, what about their fields? What fields did they train in? They didn't train in computer science because there were no computers before Alan Turing, right? So what did they train in? Physics and, and math, okay? So this, you know, there's nothing wrong with being an Ivy League trained white male mathematician, right? Some of my best friends are white Ivy League male mathematicians, all right? But the problem is that people embed their own biases in technology. And when we have a very small and homogeneous group of people who are telling us what the future is going to be, then that vision of the future is influenced by these folks' own biases, okay? So these folks were really into speculative fiction. And they thought, oh, I really wanna make the stuff in science fiction real? And so they told us, oh, this is definitely going to be real in the future. And so we can challenge these notions. And in fact, we must challenge these notions if we wanna be more realistic about the function of AI in the world. And also if we wanna make a more equitable technological world. Because a lot of bias is unconscious, right? So I'm not saying that 
uh, computer programmers are out there uh, saying, I want to make racist technology. Because I just, you know, I couldn't get up in the morning if I believed that. But we all have unconscious bias. And we're all working on it. But we all have unconscious bias. And when we embed it in the systems that we make, the problem is it's unconscious so we can't see it. Right? So one thing we can do is we can have more diverse teams building important technology. Okay? Really important step that we can take. Uh, we can also take into account a factor called positive asymmetry. So this is something uh, about group dynamics, where when you're in a group of people, say working on a project together, nobody wants to be the party pooper. All right? Nobody wants to be the one who says, hey, I think this AI system that we're building to pick who should, uh, who should get a mortgage, I think that system might be racist. I think that because we're using zip code, well, zip code in the US is actually a proxy for race, and we're going to end up denying loans to people of color. Right? Nobody wants to be that person. Right? It's a social dynamic. But these are really important conversations to have. Right? Journalism is important because journalists have these kinds of conversations. We bring up these things publicly. We're not afraid to ask questions. We're not afraid to ask the tough questions and to talk about the really difficult things in the world. Right? So inside organizations, we need to think about positive asymmetry. And we need to think about it in terms of when we build technology. What are the problems that we're not talking about? And this also comes up because there's a lot of corruption. And we have this idea that, oh, if we just put more technology into the world, this techno-chauvinist idea that if we just use more technology, uh, everything is going to just like turn into this digital utopia, and it's all going to be hearts and flowers, and people are going to be kind to each other and perfectly rational and act reasonably. And I would love that, but that has not proven to be the case in the many, many decades of the technological world that we have right now. So as journalists, we're concerned with plain old corruption. And the corruption that we have now is pretty much the same as the corruption we've had always. And so one of the things that happens in the AI world is when you have less human oversight, you have more opportunities for corruption. Okay. So what can we do? All right, uh, doom and gloom about technology. Uh, well, the first thing you can do is you can read my book. All right. <laughs> Uh, and in the book, I do a deep dive about what an AI is and isn't, and how can we talk about AI better so that we can build better technology that really works for human beings as opposed to technology that works against human beings or promotes opportunities for corruption or promotes racism, uh, et cetera. And another thing we can do is we can understand the reality of AI, what AI is and isn't. Uh, and often we say, oh, I really want to use AI. And sometimes you don't need to use AI. Sometimes you can use a simple knife instead of using a laser blowtorch. And that's OK. All right? It's not competition. Uh, we can also give up the fantasy of automated personalized news without humans in the loop. Because if you really examine our ideas about what the future of news looks like, most of those ideas don't involve human beings. All right? They involve getting rid of expensive, time-consuming human resources. And most of the ideas involve automating everything. And it's a nice fantasy, but it's totally imaginary. And we don't actually want an automated system where there's no humans involved. We want a human in the loop system. We want people to have jobs, and also humans are way more interesting. Okay. Uh, we can also differentiate between AI and automation. So again, we need to be specific in our terms. Uh, when you automate something, you are not necessarily using artificial intelligence. Uh, and then finally, we can read more widely. Uh, there is a really interesting literature out there right now 
of resistance to techno-chauvinism. Uh, really nuanced journalistic work that looks at technology and society and says, what kind of world are we building? What kind of world do we want? And how can we use technology in a really thoughtful, intelligent way in order to stop reflecting the world as it is and move us closer toward the world as it should be? Thank you.